Thank you very much. I want to welcome everyone to the call this afternoon. Thank you for joining us. And we are deeply honored to have on our third monthly policy call, our keynote speaker, Edmund Phelps. Uh, Ned Phelps, as I think most of you know, won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2006. He has been a professor at Columbia since 1972, and he has been the McVicker Professor of Political Economy at Columbia since 1982, and is also the director of the Columbia University Center on Capitalism and Society. Uh, on a personal note, I am very proud to call Ned a friend. And I wanna encourage everyone on the call today to do two things. One is to check out the center at Columbia, the Center on Capitalism and Society, look at its website and look at, at the wonderful work that Ned and his colleagues have been doing. And then second, you need to buy and read this book. This book is Mass Flourishing. It's, it's Ned's most recent book, Princeton Press. The subtitle is How Grassroots Innovation Created Jobs, Challenge, and Change. And Ned talks about among other things, the need to rehabilitate modern capitalism by clearing away blocks to its dynamism, both in society's values and in its institution. That's a form of disruption, if you will, and, and that in part explains why we're so happy to have Ned with us. When I look at Ned's professional work throughout his career, he is a man who has been ahead of his time in so many respects. First of all, on the Phillips curve, about the trade-off between inflation and unemployment. Second, on the shortcomings of rational expectations models in, in economics. And also on the sources of a country's structural dynamics, dynamism. He has written recently, along with Roman Friedman, on the, uh, on the Trump tax bill about uh, why it's, it's impossible at this point to uh, predict the effect of the tax bill. On, uh, on investment and growth. And then finally, if I'm right about Ned's always being ahead of his time, what does it tell all of us? What does it tell us about the American automobile industry and self-driving vehicles that Professor Phelps doesn't own a car? So with that, uh, Ned, I turn everything over to you and thank you again for joining us this afternoon. Welcome. <laughs> Should I start? Absolutely, yes. Okay, well thank you, Charlie, for that wonderful introduction. And I'm very grateful to have this opportunity to talk about some of the ideas in my book, Mass Flourishing, ideas that I continue to uh, own up to and, and um, try to improve upon. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to organize my talk mostly around um, uh, a talk I gave in, uh, uh, of Rome uh, just exactly a week ago, um, and uh, but, but I'll cut out the European parts and focus on America. Uh, I think the, the, the question that I keep coming back to, maybe I get a little closer to answering halfway well, uh, is what does a country have to do to develop uh, on a wide scale? The, the prospering and flourishing that are, are at the heart of the good life and, 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 and thus central to uh, a good economy. Uh, well, in, in, in recent years, the economies in the West have been anything but those things. Uh, uh, the country, America, has been suffering for a long time, in my estimation, about five decades, uh, from a familiar, familiar set of symptoms. I'll just mention three. Uh, meager rates of return to investment. Um, national income growing at a snail's pace and national wage levels even slower. And, and um, a considerable rise in um, working age people unwilling or unable to participate in the labor force. Now, what are the causes? <clears throat> Some economists, um, most conspicuously my, my friend Larry Summers, uh, speaks of secular, secular stagnation. That was a term that the Keynesian Alvin Hansen used in 1937 in, in understanding the uh, Great Depression. And similarly, Ben Bernanke, uh, the former uh, Fed chairman, uh, speaks of a global 
saving glut, thus a deficiency of effective demand, as Keynes called it. But in, 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 as I see it, uh, demand has not been weak enough to produce, uh, uh, has, has not been strong enough <laughs> to, to produce uh, uh, signs of deflation or even just disinflation. Um, we're not, we don't see anything like the, the characteristic uh, uh, consequences of, of uh, deficiency of demand. Uh, in my view, the immediate cause of the stagnation in the US as well as in Europe is the slowdown of productivity growth. Um, the, um, the, the under, and the underlying cause of the productivity slowdown, broadly speaking, is the net losses of, net losses of aggregate indigenous innovation. And what do I mean by net losses? I mean losses net of the gains that, that came uh, from uh, new industries, the digital revolution, and, and other sources. On net, in other words, uh, as the British would say, uh, we're way, the rate of, innovate, the rate of uh, innovation is way down. Uh, <clears throat> now, what is the social significance uh, of, of, this, of, of, of this net loss of innovation, uh, which has been ongoing for, um, I don't mean it's getting worse and worse, it's just that it's, it dropped down to a lower speed and, and, uh, and it hasn't changed much since that time. Um, what, what is the social significance of all of that? Uh, well, some of these are obvious and don't need any commenting, commenting on, but uh, I would note in passing that uh, in the view of some economists, such as um, another friend of mine, Joe Stiglitz, uh, the main significance of the losses of innovation is that the participants in the labor force have felt deprived of the slowdown in the growth of their wage rates. But I, I get a little exasperated at, 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 at all this lamentation about slower wage, wage growth. I mean, wage rates have been rising since uh, oh, 1815 or so. And, and I wonder how much, how many more decades or centuries do we do we need uh, uh, continuing uh, wage growth? Well, that's just a little controversial uh, aside that um, I, I wanted to make. As I see it, the main significance uh, of, of the uh, slowdown is the um, is that the losses of innovation, especially indigenous innovation as distinct from copying from overseas, that the losses of innovation have deprived many participants of individualistic wards, the rewards, which go much deeper than collective rewards like earning the general wage rate or buying goods at the general price level. Um, and let me talk a little about that. We humans are not machines. What is most precious to us, I think, is, is, is our sense of agency and the scope of, of the agency that we are able to uh, exercise. I think this was, was what the 19th century was all about. A new way of life was spreading, going one's own way, taking one's chances, seizing one's opportunities. Charles Dickens depicted um, the emergence of a new society in which people increasingly took control of their lives, many of them having careers that they could not possibly have imagined before. Um, some of you uh, may know the, the work of Paul Johnson, the British historian. 
he, he documents the uh, beginning of this phenomenon uh, around 1815. He calls it the birth of the modern. Uh, modernistic satisfactions are individualistic. They're not collective. And I, I, I think this is so important that it's worth, worth uh, touching on the, um, on the three bases here. Um, I see three kinds of rewards <clears throat> of this individualistic sort. First, one may take satisfaction in achieving something through one's own efforts and may find satisfaction from, from the better terms or greater recognition that might result from one's efforts. <clears throat> These rewards are experiential and have a creative aspect. They're about succeeding, or to use a narrower term, prospering. Success, successes come in many forms. An office worker winning a raise, uh, a craftsman seeing his hard-earned mastery result in a better product, a merchant satisfaction at seeing his ship come in, or a scholar's sense of validation from being awarded an honorary degree. Well, that's one kind of individualistic reward, but there are others. Second, a person may find satisfaction from the unfolding of his or her life in rewarding ways. The thrill of voyaging into the unknown, the excitement of the challenges, the gratification of overcoming obstacles, and the fascination with the uncertainties. Last but not least, there is the satisfaction of acting on the world and with luck making a mark <clears throat> or making a dent, as the Beatles put it. It seems to me that these last two kinds of satisfaction are what is often meant by the term flourishing. Now, <clears throat> is there any evidence um, to support my claim that a large loss of indigenous innovation in the country causes employed people to feel a serious loss of human satisfaction. Well, um, <clears throat> in my book, Mass Flourishing, I show a chart showing that the mean level, that, that in, in 1990, in, in, in the period 1990 to 1991, the mean level of reported job satisfaction was very low in those countries suffering low levels of indigenous innovation, Italy and France, for example, and relatively high in countries with relatively high ind indigenous innovation, Switzerland, Denmark, and America. What was the source, the wellspring, of the indigenous innovation that brought the satisfactions I call prospering and flourishing? And what has been causing the losses of this innovation? So now we get down to it. <clears throat> I have mentioned for years that the source was the rise of the modernism that sprung up in Southern Europe in Renaissance times. <clears throat> um, I'll just name drop here uh, the ambition of Cellini, the individualism of the Luther, the vitalism of Cervantes, the personal growth that Montaigne talked about, the need for imagination that Hume recognizes the role of the imagination, and the acceptance of the unknown in Kierkegaard. Uh, some of you um, may also know the, um, the 19th century philosophers, Charles Peirce, William James, Friedrich Nietzsche, and Henri Bergson. Uh, in my book, I also maintain that innovation was also pervasive and inclusive. Pervasive in the sense that it was in most, if not all, industries, and inclusive in the sense that it involved people from the grassroots of society on up. Much perhaps most, 
of the contribution of innovation to economic growth can be laid to the new ideas of ordinary people engaged in ordinary business life. The work they did every day led them to conceive of possibly better methods in farms, factories, and offices. Though they certainly were aware that commercial success uh, for anything that might be under, un undertaken of that sort uh, would be uncertain. <clears throat> Is there any evidence to back the thesis that the desire to innovate is fueled by values, the, 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 the Cellini, Luther, Cervantes stuff. Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, there is, thanks to some ingenious research. A statistical analysis uh, by my research team, I'm proud to say, um, has come up with a uh, uh, a, um, an analysis of uh, 18 countries in the OECD. It shows that the, this analysis shows that the countries with higher economic performance, as measured by job satisfaction and labor force participation rates, those countries tend to have higher levels of the right values or lower values or, or lower levels of the wrong values. Um, I'm not sure whether you have that chart in front of you, but um, that, that was uh, another very gratifying piece of evidence. They're hard to come by. Uh, <clears throat> now, um, this key role of attitudes, um, uh, attitudes and uh, values. Uh, this is something that was that 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 is that is completely outside the um, economics that uh, students are taught until very recently. Most economists uh, were either Schumpeterians believing that the innovations we observe were just obvious applications by an experienced entrepreneur of a scientist's discovery somewhere, or the economists were Hayekians, believing that what we really observe are not anything really new, they're just adaptations that result when unseen and, ev and evolving opportunities are intuited by a business, uh, by a businessman. <clears throat> All right, now, if we can understand the rise of innovation beginning around 1815, um, in terms of uh, values reaching a critical mass, uh, can we explain uh, the loss of, of, of innovation around the end of the 60s, early 70s. Can we explain the loss of that in terms of a, of a, of a loss of modern values? Well, um, I think we can. <clears throat> um, I think that things have happened in the realm of values that may account for the weakness of, of um, of um, indigenous innovation, not just in the United States, but also in, in uh, France and Britain. Um, for example, take vitalism. Do we still score as high on vitalism as we used to do? Uh, I'm not convinced that we do. I wonder whether Americans are still doers. Do they love to compete as much uh, as they did in the decades, say, uh, from the 1850s right up to the mid-1960s? 
or are they still the couch potatoes that it was said they, they had become uh, some decades ago? Are they fixed on all the tweets coming in by the hour and rather thinking about new stuff they might be creating? It appears to me that in the present age, since World War II, there is a dread of uh, uncertainty. I'm referring to what economists call Knightian uncertainty after Frank Knight. It means that people just don't know whether, they, that whether the dice will turn, out, turn up heads or tails. No, it's not like that. I, they, they, what, the, what they really have a fear of is uh, not knowing what the probabilities are radical uncertainty. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I gave this presentation in, in uh, Italy last week and I had the opportunity to comment to my audience that uh, the Pope had just commented on this very thing. He was complaining about the, 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 the uncomfortableness, the, the, the dislike that people have uh, of uncertainty. Another point, the, the flagrant short-termism of corporate heads and our representatives and legislatures uh, is, is another possible explanation of the decline of innovation. Uh, answering a, a query that uh, came from uh, Larry Summers one day on the internet, I will confess, I do look at it once in a while. Um, I, I, I looked into what has happened to the steepness of the yield curve since the earliest period on record to recent periods. The trend has been up. The yield curve has been getting steeper in the period, uh, I, I, won't, I won't give you the numbers, uh, but, but that does look like a, a loss of vitalism, uh, a fear of uncertainty. And how can you have innovation if you don't have uncertainty? I mean, if you, if you can't stand uncertainty, you, you, you've got to get out of the place where they make the innovation. Um, I also sense that there has been a decline of individualism uh, in the West and uh, America included. Where are the Horatio Alger stories? Where are the young people asking the Horace Greeley's uh, in what direction to go. I am shocked that young Americans report in opinion surveys that they want to remain in their hometown, live close to their friends, or even continue to live at home. That was just unbelievable to me. Uh, this is not the country that I uh, grew up in, uh, looking at the Saturday Evening Post every week uh, with uh, a painting by Norman Rockwell uh, showing people doing all sorts of, uh, uh, of uh, adventurous things. Uh, <clears throat> there's, um, there are other hypotheses. I, John Dewey, the American philosopher, talked about the rise of a money culture. Now that may su surprise, that may seem odd that I would bring that in. Don't people innovate in order to make a bundle? Uh, well, sure, they would appreciate the bundle, we all do. But I, I, I would submit that um, if, if, if you wanted to, to get rich, probably you wouldn't be wanting to try to innovate all day. There, there would be better rates of return out there. Um, People have a yen to innovate because they get tremendous kick out of it, and uh, they love the uncertainty, and and, the, and they the love they love the feeling of success when when they get lucky. <clears throat> um, I'm uh, watching the time as best I can, so let me. Let me try to uh, close up rather quickly here. Uh, a huge influence, I think, 
on the slowdown of innovation is that uh, there has been a, a recrudescence of uh, corporatism. <clears throat> um, as some of you may know, uh, a new set of values arose uh, under the name of corporatism in the 1890s, especially in Germany, France, and Italy. And this, this uh, system of thought was put into practice in the interwar period by Mussolini. Um, the essence of this doctrine is that society is a coordinated body. So companies ought not to do what would harm the state and, 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 they, and companies may be obliged to act for the good of society. That way of thinking, of course, is very deeply antithetical to individualism. A, a would-be innovator might be looked at as selfish in, in, in a corporatist society, and they are. And, and, um, and to the extent that uh, an innovator, uh, that, uh, that a would-be innovator uh, actually succeeds, the, the, um, the innovator may be regarded as disrupt, disruptive and thus antisocial. And now, I think that in recent decades, uh, this is not a very popular thing to say, but I, I believe that neocorporatism has cropped up and it, it sees, sees it as an obligation uh, of society to extend social protection to various groups and to ensure that all groups advance in lockstep. This neocorporatism also sees it as acceptable that companies protect themselves from competition from others. Self-protection, you might call it. This has led to an unprecedented acceptance of monopoly power, which is very bad for innovation, certainly. Um, I think you all know a lot about the abusive use of patents to keep competitors out and protected protectionist regulations are also, also serve to keep out outsiders. Why has society allowed these government abuses to arise? My answer is that much of the citizenry have lost their allegiance to modernist values. <clears throat> Finally, um, I know you're interested in policy, so I'll just make this last point. Politicians have taken ad hoc measures that directly block competition from new ideas. The entry of startup firms is impeded through a variety of actions, from tariffs and quotas to outright aid to incumbents to save established companies from losing market share. Furthermore, when incumbents become safe from firms with new ideas, then these incumbents can afford to cut back whatever defensive innovation they might have done. All this represents a serious rejection of individualism in favor of collective action. So I conclude, we're faced with a significant alienation from the modern values the necessary individualism, vitalism, and expression, expressionism that drove massive innovation in the lead economies of the West in the 19th century. And we're faced with a rise of postmodern values that celebrate every nonprofit enterprise more than any commercial enterprise. To regain the dynamism of old, we need to return to these modernist values and reject the postmodern ones. Sorry for going on too long. Um, Ned, uh, that was that was fantastic. Thank you, thank you very much. And I would again encourage our participants today to uh, to read Mass Flourishing. It really it's it's a fantastic book. You've given us a very crisp summary of many of the ideas. I just want to, if I could, begin by asking you a question. Uh, you just been elected president of the United States. 
and your campaign slogan was to make America flourish again, not make America great again, but make America flourish again. So you've hinted at some of the, the uh, impediments to flourishing. Um, what would you do on your, in your first 100 days as uh, the new president to make America flourish? I thought you'd probably ask that question, Charlie, um, <laughs> though I didn't know the president thing was, was coming. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I'll take it to know the job is tough. Uh, um, I, I, it, it's, it's such a hard question to, to, to uh, answer. I think, I think anything and everything that, that comes to mind, we should probably follow up on because we're going to need to do a whole lot of things. The, the theme of, 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 of what I've just been talking about in these last 30 minutes is that we're not going to get anywhere unless we change attitudes. So, uh, so let's, let's talk about that. How can we change uh, attitudes? Well, I don't imagine we can do it overnight with, with every adult uh, person in the country. Uh, but we can, I think, begin to uh, change the uh, educational system so that um, students in high school, and maybe sooner, read, read uh, novels and other books of adventure and exploration um, so that they can they have models in their head of people that they would like to be like. And, and, and so that they can get a sense of, of lives that they would like to live. And, and, and um, also, I think schools should be, I wouldn't have thought of this until just recently, I was reading a piece about Richard Wilbur, um, the poet, and, and, um, and the, the, um, Richard Wilbur was somebody who wasn't embarrassed to, to, to try to capture the possibility of joy that is very much in, 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 uh, uh, present in, in, in life. There are lots of things to be joyful about, and let's focus on those, and let's try to keep ourselves open to those as much as possible. And certainly let's don't bring our children up to think that life is horrible and that you just, you better uh, scratch around and do the best you can. Uh, so, so it's not so as to be ready for, ready for the worst. Um, I, I think, I think um, all of that is very, very important. Uh, the trouble was, is, of course, that uh, high school stu students uh, won't be in uh, won't be in, in positions to uh, dream up a new idea for six, eight, ten years. So this is this is not going to revolutionize things uh, right away. And I'm not suggesting that, that is sufficient, but I think it's a natural place to start. Chris, thank you. Um, let me ask if we have uh, questions from our participants on the call. I think uh, Lenny Mendoza might be here, Howard Floor. Uh, so let's open the floor, Chris, to uh, questions for, uh, for Ned Fox. Charlie, do you want to do one while folks think of questions? Yeah, uh, Ned, I noticed in your book, I checked the index while you were talking, and uh, there's one reference, only one reference on page 82 to Ayn Rand, the great... <laughs> The great uh, philosopher guru, if you will, of um, vital vitalism in the form of libertarianism. So, what's what's wrong with the sort of Ayn Rand heroic vitalism, if you will, unchained? Uh, does that help get to where you want the country to go? Um, 
I, I've enjoyed reading a bit of Ayn Rand, but um, as, as I uh, grew a little older and uh, wiser, uh, I, I, I came to think that um, she's not a solution to, uh, to, uh, to our problems. Um, an economic world that's oriented toward innovation is uh, not likely to be one that is in which everybody is trying to get ahead of everybody else and 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 uh, and everybody is um, uh, <clears throat> oriented around wealth and power. Uh, there is, I think, there is an altruistic uh, aspect to uh, innovation. I think if you're if you're somebody working in a company and and uh, thinking about a better way of doing something, uh, you, you, you're, you're hoping that y you will be admired for your contribution. And um, my wife, uh, Viviana, whom you know, Charlie, uh, she was saying to me just uh, a couple of days ago, she was saying, gee, um, uh, people who, uh, are um, keeping an eye out for, uh, or keeping their minds open to uh, uh, conceiving of a better way to do something. They're they're not oriented just towards getting a raise for it, or even for patting themselves on the back and showing, how, feeling how smart they are. They're 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 also doing something for the guys that they're working with, and. Um, they're thinking of it as something that will make the make the company better, make it work better, make make it uh, more enjoyable, uh, and, and uh, so you just don't find this in 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 uh, Ayn Rand or Ayn Rand, however you pronounce it. Never did be sure that I got it right, but uh, which which is not to say that that there there that there you can't find some paragraphs in there that. Aren't aren't quite interested. That 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 uh, I, I agree that there, there's she makes some interesting interesting points. Um, by the way, um, well, for example, uh, she has an example somewhere about uh, a bus a bus with some empty seats and uh, and there's some <clears throat> poor poor guy who's been working in the fields all day and. Uh, it's 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 agreed by the people on the bus. It's it's fine for him to go on the bus and take a, one of the empty seats. He doesn't have to pay for it. People are happy to do that. It's, it's, so even 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 Rand uh, it, it is not uh, not someone who's advocating uh, imperviousness to. Uh, uh, Imperviousness to um, uh, taking care of people in in need, uh, stopping for uh, somebody who's uh, in trouble. You know, um, she doesn't say that everybody should be monstrous, but I don't. But to, to come back to your question. I don't think she's in any way a solution to uh, the deficiency of innovation that we're struggling with now. Great. Okay. Yeah, if I just one quick question, Ned, you, which really interested me for a long time, you referred to the flagrant short termism, the short term thinking of corporate leaders and legislators. How do we change that? And you, economists are all about economic incentives for change. How yes. do we get out of right. this? Be able to fix it, right. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I don't know how to work out the nitty gritty, 
of, of an answer, but um, I, I certainly do um, think that um, something has to be done. We, we, we've got to think of some way of rewriting uh, the contracts with the CEO so that they have uh, 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 a long-term vision. So that, so that they share in the long-term rewards, in the distant rewards, share more in the distant rewards and share less in, the, in early rewards. Um, it, it, shouldn't be, it shouldn't be very hard to do that. Um, how we're going to get um, ex acceptance of that, that's another story. I mean, this comes back to, to my theme. Look, we're just not going to get anywhere being clever and rewriting contracts and stuff like that if, if, if the public is not there. If people don't think, yes, that's right, I am willing to accept the drop in the share price in order to have a company that is doing great things and that will, and that with luck, maybe, yeah, maybe with luck, uh, will even uh, deliver uh, capital gains that I haven't uh, dreamed of. But, but the main thing is I, I do want to, I do want my money to be invested in companies that uh, uh, engage in, 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 in that, that are, that are ready and eager to, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to keep an eye out for opportunities for, for innovation and, 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 and keep an eye out for um, and, 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 and companies that, that stimulate their employees to dream up um, ideas for innovation. We have uh, two people who have their hands raised right now, so we're gonna hope to squeeze these in. Um, I'm going to ask, uh, to start with Maria. Maria, you have the microphone. Oh, great. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Um, I think what's interesting to me is that it perhaps is the bubble in which I am operating, but um, I see an iconic celebration of, uh, of, the, of innovators and innovation within media and within the, the sort of tech-fueled aspect of industry that I'm involved with digital, um, and even a celebration of sort of there's a, you know, of, of the, the, the entrepreneurial focus, and I'm right now working on new ideas um, as a potential startup. But I, what I'm struggling with in that, in your thesis is, if we're in an in media environment which is celebrating the innovation and literally, you know, going to conferences where there's chief and sort of companies are searching for magic bullets to become more innovative. How does that coexist with your, with your focus on, you know, the institutional supports for this? How do, how do those two values coexist at the same time? Well, thanks for the question. I'm not sure that I, I, I understood all of it, or in other words, I'm not sure I can give a good answer. Uh, I, I think you're asking, in, at least in part, um, what do I make of these uh, companies uh, uh, in the media area who um, every minute are uh, <laughs> trying to come up with something new? In, 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 uh, uh, so uh, that's simply great. Unfortunately, there's not enough of that. That what what I what I keep trying to say with with clarity, but I'm not sure I always succeed. Is is that we, yes? Thank God for Silicon Valley. Thank God for 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 uh, the the media, the new media industries, and so forth. The trouble is though that that space maybe produces 5% of, of the gross domestic product. And, 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 and uh, it, it, it's not driving wage growth, wage growth 
and it's and it's not making jobs generally exciting across the lens across the land. Uh, I'm, I hope that this at least touches on on on, on what your question was. No, no. Yep. So it's 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 narrow. Yeah. When, when narrow, I, when it's I narrow and deep. When I was talking with my uh, editor at Princeton University Press, Seth Ditchick, he hit upon the word narrowing. He, saying, he said, what you mean is that innovation is narrowing, that it's disappearing from, uh, but that, even that wasn't exactly right because it's narrowing in some places and burgeoning in some other places where it, was, where it wasn't present at all before. But the net effect is, We've got less innovation in the aggregate than we used to have. Interesting. Thank you, Maria. Uh, I think we've got time for one more question, and that is Mark Bregman. Um, we, we have, Mark, you've been unmuted, so we're ready for you to take the mic. Um, I, I think you mentioned two out of three issues that I worry about when I think about what's going on. You talked about sort of individualism versus collectivism. I think of that as the Ayn Rand dialogue. We're all in it for ourselves. You also talked about what I'll call fiscalism, the focus on the dollars, particularly in the corporate world, not on the broader impact that a company can have. But there seems to me there's a third one. There's a book that came out about a year ago by James Kwok called Economism. And it really focus, uh, focuses on the fact that over a 30 or 40 year period, we've been uh, fed a, uh, a line on, of a very simplistic view of economics that starts with the supply demand curve and it ends with the supply demand curve. And you hear this frequently from people in, in leadership positions in Washington who have been, absorbed this and have the view that, well, all we need to do is open up the market, free market, the visible hand of Adam Smith will solve healthcare, will solve everything else. Mm -hmm. And yet my perspective is that these challenges, there's a much richer, more complex dimension to economics, which they're missing. And therefore, this simplistic idea, which is driving a lot of policy, is driving us down a very dangerous direction, along with the focus on individualism and the focus on fiscalism uh, in the business world. Can you, can you comment on that? And, and if you have any ideas of a direction or a solution, I would love to hear them. Well, um, I like the question. Uh, I hope my answer is as good as the question. Um, let me say, in, in, in I, I understand you didn't accuse me of anything. I am an <laughs> economist, but you didn't directly accuse me. But I, let me say that I spent my whole career trying to nudge economists away from these mechanical models. So, for example, when uh, after I'd written enough papers, maybe over three years or so that I had some credentials, uh, I started injecting expectations into wage setting and price setting. This was unheard of. Uh, so uh, as I, I joke somewhere on a website, um, I, my, 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 whole, my whole career has been uh, devoted to uh, putting the people into economic models. So uh, I'm certainly not one of those who think that, oh, if we just uh, opened uh, medical care to um, uh, the marketplace, uh, we'd be fine. For a lot of patients, we would be fine. But <laughs> for a lot of patients, probably we wouldn't be fine. And, and uh, I, uh, so I, yes, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm as against uh, e economism as you are. That's why I, I, I didn't come to this uh, assignment this afternoon with a whole list of, of legislative, uh, uh, with a legislative agenda that, that I thought, that, that I proposed would, would uh, help the situation. I don't think it would help the situation at all. I, I think we can't get anywhere and we, in, until we get uh, a shift of the culture back to uh, the, the good old days of uh, exploration and creativity and uh, uh, 
uh, and uh, and the rest. I think that is actually a perfect note on which to end the conversation because we are very close to the top of the hour. Um, Professor Phelps, thanks so much. Charlie, did you want to say any words at, 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 as closing here? I would just like to thank Ned and, uh, and Catherine Picula at Columbia. This is just uh, absolutely fantastic. And I want to, again, suggest uh, that all of our particip participants buy and read Mass Flourishing. You will really enjoy the book. An economist who cites Cervantes uh, is, uh, is wonderful. So Ned, thank you once again for, for being with us. Thanks for inviting me, Charlie, and thank you all for listening to me. I appreciate it. <laughs>